whole range Order, of other questions. Senator Wish Wilson, you'll be in continuation. I will move to question time and I'll start. Senator, sorry, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Uh, I advise the Senate that Senator Canavan will be absent from question time today, Thursday, 14 November 2019, due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Canavan's absence, Senator Birmingham will represent the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia. Senator Cash will represent the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, the Minister for Regional Services, Decentralisation and Local Government, and the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. And I might just advise uh, the Chamber that when these representative arrangements were put in place, Senator McKenzie was also uh, due to be absent from question time to attend a food minister's meeting in, uh, in New Zealand, but because we know that the opposition had a particular interest this week, we ensured that Senator McKenzie was available and she will be leaving Australia to attend the meeting uh, after question time. Order. Uh, Senator Wong? I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. Thank leave you. I thank the Senate. Well, the question that should be asked is why the government leader in the Senate no longer trusts the deputy leader of the National Party to represent the National Party. He doesn't trust order. him to represent have, the leader of the National Cor Party. Senator Wong, I have Senator Cormann on a point of order. Um, Leave was provided to provide a, a brief statement, not to run. Uh, that is Order. What, what we just experienced was not Senator White. was not a brief statement. It's, this is this is a, a political spray, uh, which is without foundation because it's based on an assumption that whatever a gossip is published on Twitter is somehow accurate. Uh, um, I. Senators know that once leave is granted, leave is granted. I'm not in a position to restrict its use. Senator Wong. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, on Monday, Senator Canavan was absent, and as is normal, as has previously occurred, occurred and as would be normal, Senator McKenzie represented him. But of course, she struggled to answer anything. She took, I think it was seven out of nine questions on notice. And now we have the extraordinary situation where the Deputy Leader of the National Party is not trusted by the Liberals to speak for the National Party. We've got an extraordinary situation where a Liberal Party senator represents the leader of the National Party in this place. Well, I think the only conclusion is they don't trust Senator McKenzie, the Liberals don't trust Senator McKenzie, and or, and or they don't trust the National Party to speak for themselves. Senator Cormann. Uh, so th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I seek leave to make a brief statement. Is leave granted? Is order on my left. I've got... Uh, so on Senator Wong on the request for leave. Uh, we will grant leave. We also grant, will grant leave for Senator McKenzie as to why she's not representing her leader. It's going to be a long afternoon. Um, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, what, what we've just seen uh, is, a, is, a, is a display of what the Labor Party has descended into. Here, here we are. We've got communities across uh, large parts of Australia, large parts of Australia fighting, fighting bushfires. We're dealing, we're, we're dealing with some serious, serious challenges. Senator McKenzie today, Senator McKenzie today is due to depart Australia to attend a food minister's meeting uh, in New Zealand. When the, when the arrangements were made, when the arrangements were made as to who would represent Senator Canavan today, when Minister McKenzie was also to be absent. Uh, Obviously, uh, the arrangements were put in place on the basis, as I have advised the Chamber. Uh, to, 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 to suggest that there is some sort of conspiracy here is juvenile, uh, it is desperate, uh, and it just shows the Labor Party has completely lost the plot. I mean, we, we are a strong and united uh, coalition team. Senator, Senator McKenzie is an outstanding minister, uh, and if it, if, it, if it hadn't been for the fact that she was due to depart Australia for New Zealand earlier, uh, the uh, representative arrangements would have been different. But, but I mean, any question, I'm sure that any question the Labor Party wants to address to Senator McKenzie, uh, she will, as always, uh, respond to uh, with absolute distinction. Yeah. Senator Wong. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? What leave is granted for one minute? Uh, if the story goes as the Leader of the Government suggests it does, can he please advise why the opposition was not advised of Senator McKenzie's absence earlier today? 9.07am, you sent an email, but all of a sudden she's available. 
So why is she not representing the, the lead of the, the National Party? We haven't officially started question time yet, but I, I think the minister would like to answer the. Are you, I think the Australian people would be quite. I was asked a question, so I'll answer it. I think the Australian people would be quite confused that we're spending this much time on this issue. I, mean, I, I think they'd be quite confused that this is the most important priority for the Labor Party. The reason, the reason is by, because, because by the time I sent the letter to the president, the decision was made. Prior to sending the letter, the decision was made that we would ensure that Senator McKenzie would be available in question time today, specifically because, of course, the particular interest that has been uh, you know, obviously on display in this chamber uh, in relation to Senator McKenzie's portfolio areas of responsibility. And, and, of course, and, and, of course, and that is why Senator McKenzie uh, has delayed her departure from Australia. If that decision had been made earlier, if that decision had been made last week, then obviously uh, you know, we would have uh, made different arrangements. It being 2.06, we'll now move to question time. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. I refer to the minister who told the Senate that, and I quote, we are actually delivering more jobs and a lower unemployment rate, and guess what? Wages growth is actually picking up. But Labor Force data released today shows that 19,000 jobs were lost in the last month. Unemployment is up and underemployment is up. Given downgrades to economic growth, continuing record low wages growth and worsening employment figures, when will the Morrison government finally act to turn around the economy stagnating under its watch? The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The first point I would make is that since we came into government, about 1.5 million new jobs were created. 1.5 million new jobs. When we came into government, we inherited a weakening economy, rising unemployment, and a rapidly deteriorating Order. budget position. The uh, unemployment rate was on track to uh, reach six and a quarter percent and rising. The unemployment rate today is 5.3 percent. Let me also let me also say uh, that uh, employment growth in the uh, 12 months to the end of October uh, 2019 was two percent, two percent above the long the decade average of 1.8 percent, above the decade average of 1.8 percent. Now, of course. I mean, of course, the Australian economy is facing headwinds. We're facing global economic Order. headwinds, and, we, and the Labor Party can laugh about this. And, and the floundering shadow treasurer, who is chasing Albo's job, Order. may sort of take, take great, Order on my left. great pleasure out of talking down the Australian economy. Let me tell you, if he wants to keep talking down the economy, go right ahead. The truth is. The truth is that our economy and our jobs market is in better position than it would have been uh, if Labor had been able to implement their $387 billion in higher taxes, if Labor had been able to implement the anti-business uh, socialist agenda which would have harmed the economy, uh, led to higher unemployment uh, and would of course have left every Australian worse off. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. I do have one, Mr President. Thank you. Treasurer Frydenberg will use a speech today to call on state and territory governments to row together to increase productivity. The Morrison government has now blamed global headwinds, the drought, labour, the RBA and state and territory governments for the state of the economy. When will the coalition government of six years finally take responsibility to turn around slowing economic growth and worsening employment figures? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, again, I, I repeat again, the Australian economy continues to grow. Uh, employment growth continues to run above the decade average of 1.8 per cent. And, and you know, of course, when, when it comes to the productivity challenge, are you really suggesting that an Australian government should not be working with state and territory governments to ensure that we pursue a deregulation agenda, to ensure that uh, we make it easier for business to be successful so they can be more profitable, hire more Australians and pay them better wages over time? I, I mean, the implication of that question is that somehow an Australian government shouldn't make an effort to improve productivity by working together uh, with the states and territories. Of course, I mean, I, I commend I commend the Treasurer's speech uh, to every senator in this chamber, as I commend it to all Australians. Uh, and indeed, it will be another fine speech explaining what our government is doing to build a stronger economy, create more jobs, and ensure that every Australian today and into the future has the best possible opportunity to get ahead. And you know what? You know what? I mean, the Australian people know, and the Australian people knew on Order, 18 Senator May. Senator Cormann, sorry, that was my fault. Senator Gallagher, a supplement, uh, final thank supplementary you, Mr. question. President. While the Morrison government continues to blame everyone else for the state of the economy, they refuse to take the heed, to heed the advice of the IMF, the RBA, state and territory governments and the AIG. When will the Morrison government stop blaming everyone else 
and act by bringing forward targeted and measured stimulus to turn around a floundering economy. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I said earlier, the only thing that is floundering here in Australia is the shadow treasurer. We have a floundering shadow treasurer who all he's interested in is Albo's job. He's not interested in the jobs of Australians, he's interested in Albo's job. Now the next point, the next point I would make is that we take our lead from the Australian people. I know that the Australian Labour Party still doesn't uh, isn't able to accept the verdict of the Australian people at the last election. The Australian people at the last election knew that we were facing global economic headwinds. They knew that we were dealing with the effects of the drought. They knew that we were dealing with a whole series of challenges, and they knew that it was the worst possible time to opt for Labor's high-taxing, socialist, anti-business agenda that would have left every Australian worse off. And they expect us to continue to implement our plan, which we put in front of the Australian people at the election, which is precisely what we will continue to do. Order. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. I'd like to ask him about the positive things the government continues to do to build our economy and grow jobs. Can the minister update the Senate on the outcomes of the most recent round of the negotiations for a regional comprehensive economic partnership? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Fawcett uh, for his question, and indeed is highlighting the connection between Australia's trading relationships and jobs for Australians. Of the nearly 1.5 million jobs created under our government, some 240,000 of those are trade-related. Are trade-related, and one in five Australian jobs dependent upon our trading activity. And that's why I'm very pleased to welcome the progress last week, Mr. President, uh, around the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And which, uh, when finalised, will represent the largest trading pact in the world. The RCEP 15 nations that have agreed to proceed to quickly finalise this trade deal account for almost 30 per cent of global GDP, or around 30 per cent of the world's population, 58 per cent of our two-way trade and 66 per cent of Australia's exports. This is a huge opportunity to better link Australia into value chains that bring together the 10 ASEAN nations, the major North Asian economies of China, Japan and Korea, and of course our neighbours in New Zealand. It will encompass some nine of Australia's top 15 trading partners. Importantly, in terms of progress we expect RCEP to make, it will enhance arrangements in terms of addressing non-tariff barriers such as customs procedures, quarantine and technical standards more common rules of origin which will enable Australian farmers, businesses, producers to be able to better engage in the value chains across our Asian region. Common rules on e-commerce and on intellectual property will promote trade and investment across the region. And while market access negotiations are still being finalised, it will lock in clear benefits for Australian exporters to better trade across the region. As is well known, we have also been working with India to be part of RCEP, who have been participating in negotiations since 2013. We will continue to do so. The agreement would be better with India, and that door Order, remains Senator wide Birmingham. open to them. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, Minister, in addition to RCEP, can you update the Senate about Australia's participation in China's International Import Expo? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, the China International Import Expo is the largest import and trade event of its type in the world. And I was pleased, following those RCEP negotiations in Bangkok, to join more than 200 Australian companies who were participating in the CIIE in Shanghai last week. What we saw there was that key leading Australian industry organisations, Meat and Livestock Australia, Australia, Wine Australia and Dairy Australia, together with Horticulture Innovation Australia, worked with Austrade to provide real Team Australia leadership in the promotion of Australian premium products to the huge Chinese consumer audience. This is a massive opportunity again for Australia's businesses, especially those in our premium produce areas, to highlight uh, the value, the quality and the substance of Australian goods to the world. Also pleased to witness the signing of $350 million worth of MOUs, including between Australia Post and Argyle Hotel, Metcash and Shandong Boshang, and Coles and Shanghai Fruit Day, Order, all of which Senator provide Birmingham, for continued investment the between our expired. nations. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. So, Minister, finally to outcomes. What do the recent trade statistics say about the government's trade agenda of driving economic opportunities and supporting jobs? Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, Senator Fawcett. As I highlighted at the outset, the importance of trade to jobs is very clear. And what our government has been able to deliver is now some 21 consecutive monthly trade surpluses. That's been fuelled by the fact that Australian businesses are taking advantage of the opportunity created by the trade deals that we have pursued. Australian businesses are selling at record levels. Goods exports in September posted a new monthly record high of $34.6 billion. Services exports reached a new monthly peak of $8.6 billion. And you can see the tangible benefits from our trade agreements, such as if you look at in the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, exports from our state, Senator Fawcett, of fresh or dried almonds, which have gone up from practically nothing to nearly $40 million, thanks to a tariff drop from 24 per cent to 0 per cent. Similar things can be seen across other areas of horticulture, where tariffs have been eliminated and exports have grown, Order, and that is Birmingham. precisely Time the trend the we want to see continue. Expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. In releasing the interim report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, the commissioners rightly said the aged care failures, and I quote, diminish Australia as a nation. How long will older Australians wait for the Morrison government to formally respond to the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety's interim report? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Keneally for the question, and she's right. Uh, the words that were in the Royal Commissioner's uh, report, I think, do diminish all Australians because. Uh, what was found in that report showed that there was uh, a poor attitude to people of, uh, who are aged in, in this country. Uh, it, the, the report also said that something of the order of 50 per cent of Australians in residential aged care don't get visitors. It demonstrated a broad attitude towards... It, 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 it demonstrates a broad... Broad attitude to Australians, to <coughs> senior Australians, uh, and the Royal Commission's report, quite rightly, Mr. President, the Royal Commission's report, quite rightly, indicated that um, that attitude had to change. It, it, the Royal Com Commission's Senator report, Watt. as I've said in this place before, put the government on notice, it put the opposition on notice, it put the industry, and it put the entire Australian community Order. on notice that these attitudes need to change. As I said on the afternoon, Mr. President, of releasing the report, that the government would carefully consider the matters that were raised, particularly the three items that were the, 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 the three items that were considered priorities, and that is the issue of restraint, the issue of home care packages. Order. Senator Colbeck, issue... please resume your seat. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. The, the minister only has 27 seconds left, and, and he's repeating information he's previously advised the chamber. I asked how long older Australians will have to wait until there is a formal response from the government, and I'm looking forward to hearing an answer to that question. Okay, but you've reminded. Right, on the point of order, I was happy to rule, but on, on, Senator Coleman, I'll order. take your submission. When a question on a similar topic is asked, it doesn't make the answer. Uh, not directly relevant, just because it uh, provides uh, the same information uh, that is still directly relevant to the question that was asked. So I would ask you to rule that uh, the minister was being absolutely directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Wong, on the point of order. On the point of order, it is um, somewhat disappointing that we have to take a point of order to get a government minister to answer when the government will respond to this report. Um, and I'd really, I, I, I uh, obviously you will rule. But I, I would ask the minister to please respond to the question of when this government will respond. Right. Well, look, we're now getting ranging into the debates of the merits of an answer. The minister is being directly relevant, in my view, to the first part of the question. Senator Keneally, you have reminded the minister of the final part of the question. But the minister, I'm just going to ask for silence while I rule. Um, the broader a question, the broader the answer can be. If a question transverses similar questions in previous days, then the answer inevitably could be similar as well. I cannot rule on the merits of an answer. There's an opportunity to debate that after question time. The minister is being directly relevant, in my view, to the first part of the question asked. Senator Colbeck, you are free to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so as I, as I was saying, Mr. President, the Royal Commission made uh, 
uh, recommendations or ask the government to take action in three particular areas. The, so on the issue of restraint, on the issue of home care packages and on the issue of young people in aged care. The government has quite clearly said that we would announce action on those, on those matters prior to Christmas, and that's exactly Order. what we'll do. Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Order. Senator Given Keneally's that the Morrison the government has refused to put the aged care portfolio in the Cabinet, who is leading the government response to the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think that uh, the fact that the day after the Royal Commission handed down its interim report that the government was led by the Prime Minister in responding to this matter demonstrates how important this government puts this matter. Order. So, as Minister, as Minister, I obviously have responsibilities around the development of policy, working with my colleague Minister Hunt, who is the Cabinet Minister within the health portfolio. Uh, and, the quite, and the Prime Minister, quite rightly, uh, takes a significant interest in this matter as well, bearing in mind Mr. President, that calling this Royal Commission was one of the first things that the Prime Minister did after becoming Prime Minister. The Prime Minister saw this as such an important matter Order. that he called a Royal Commission, regardless of how uncomfortable it might be for any of us, because he saw this as a significant priority for his government. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. I note the minister said that the Prime Minister and Minister Hunt are leading the response. Given the reason the minister has this week refused to take responsibility for fixing the broken aged care system, is that because he actually considers it to be the Prime Minister's responsibility to fix the broken aged care system? And what is the point of the Minister for Aged Care if not to take responsibility for the aged care system? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. And to be frank, Senator Keneally diminishes uh, this issue by reading out a pre-prepared answer that was a question that was written out before she even listened to the answer that was pre that was taken uh, in my previous answer. This government takes the issue of aged care absolutely seriously, absolutely seriously. That's why this government. That's why the Prime Minister, Mr. President, called the Royal Commission into aged care. As uncomfortable as it might be for any of us on this side, uh, we, the stories needed to be told. As the Commissioner said last week, they wanted aged people to have a voice, people who they regarded as not having a voice. Uh, and they saw the process that we're undertaking now as being uh, an important part of the Royal Commission process. So this government collectively takes responsibility. Obviously, as minister, I have responsibility for leading Order, the development Senator of policy. Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the Thank answers expired. Order, Senator Di Natale. Order, Senator Wong, Senator Polly, Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the leader of the government, uh, Minister Cormann, representing the Prime Minister. Minister, two years ago, the combined emergency services put in a business case to the federal government for additional funding for firefighting aircraft that we currently lease from the US. They received no response. Now, with California fighting their own fires out of season and with record high greenhouse pollution supercharging these mega fires, we hear commissioners and assistant commissioners saying, and I quote, we're having a problem with resources. We need to admit that. We also know that the federal contribution uh, to uh, these emergency responses is declining. Minister, why does the government continue to under-resource our emergency services? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I completely reject the proposition that we are under-resourcing our emergency uh, services. Uh, we, of course, uh, are uh, providing uh, the uh, appropriate resources, uh, of course, and working together with state and territory governments uh, who have got you know, very significant responsibilities uh, in this area. In terms of the specific uh, question that he uh, raised at the beginning of his question, I will seek further advice uh, and come back to him on notice. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. 
Uh, well, uh, Minister, former New South Wales Chief Commissioner Greg Mullins uh, disagrees with you. He says, and again I quote, if we'd been able to speak with the Prime Minister back in April, they would have had time to secure more aircraft and put in more money to have twice as many. With the coalition government supporting increased coal and gas production driving these mega fires, do you agree that the time has now come for a national disaster response unit and a fully funded aerial firefighting fleet? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, well, obviously, we've made significant efforts to boost um, our uh, capability to respond to national emergencies, and indeed we've got a dedicated uh, minister with uh, dedicated portfolio responsibility for this at cabinet level. Aerial firefighting does play an important role in protecting uh, communities and essential infrastructure and providing vital support to firefighters on the ground. Whilst aerial firefighting is one method uh, of fire suppression, fire and land management agencies across the jurisdictions use a combination of firefighting tactics uh, prior to and during operations. These include, but are not limited, uh, to hazard reduction activities in preparation for the bushfire season, establishment of a network of uh, strategic fire trials to improve access, a mix of uh, career retri reti retained and volunteer personnel, a range of specialist firefighting personnel, including remote area firefighters and specialist <laughs> strike teams, a range of assets, including tankers, bulk water carriers, marine craft, vehicles fitted with compressed air Order, Senator Cormann, time et cetera. for the answer has expired. Senator Di Natalia, final Minister, uh, Mr question. Mullins also said, and again I quote, let's draw a line under it all. I'd love to see the Greens, Labor, the Coalition and Crossbench get together and say this is a climate emergency. Let's start now and take action on the base cause, which is the burning of oil, coal and gas. Let's look after our future. Minister, just like uh, Prime Minister Howard reached across the political divide after the Port Arthur massacre. Will, you, will your government accept we're in a climate emergency and take action on climate change? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, firstly, our government is taking effective action on climate change. Uh, we are uh, on track to uh, meet and exceed our emissions reduction targets uh, for 2020 agreed to in Kyoto, and we, are, we have a plan to meet our emissions reduction targets agreed uh, to in Paris. And in relation to some of these other matters, I also would just point out again that commissioners and chief fire officers within each uh, state and territory jurisdiction determine the type and base location of area firefighting assets based on the assessed bushfire risk. Um, that is obviously an operational judgment. The National Area Firefighting Program continues to represent value for money, particularly in light of the release of the Australian Seasonal Bushfire Outlook. The outlook shows above normal fire potential across Australia following on from a very warm and dry start to the year. Uh, this year, the Australian Government will contribute 14. Uh, $0.9 billion to the National Air Fire Fighting Centre, now $14.983 million, I should say, to the National Order, Air Senator Air Fire Coleman, Fighting Centre. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology and concerns the government's support <coughs> excuse me, for steel manufacturing in Wyala. Is it not the case that, as one of only two integrated steel works in Australia, and as Australia's only manufacturer of special grade billet and steel long products, GFG's steel, uh, wireless steel works is a vital economic and national security asset. Is it not the case that the 22,000 people of Wyala remain critically reliant on the iron and steel industry? Has GFG approached the government seeking support for their plans to expand wireless steel works operations to guarantee that this key national asset continues to operate in the future? If so, what has been the government's response and what Australian government support will be forthcoming for the steel works and people of Wyala? The Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for the question and for prior notice. And Senator Patrick, I've been able to obtain the following information for you. Uh, as to the proposal that you refer to, I am advised that no formal request for assistance has been submitted by the GFG Alliance to the government to date. Uh, the Morrison government, together with the South Australian state government, continues to engage in good faith with GFG regarding the future of the Wyala Steelworks. Uh, we want the best outcomes for the people who work at the Wyala Steelworks and the local community, and we recognise that the community is dependent, uh, as you have uh, yourself pointed out, on the continued operations of the steelworks. Uh, the government will continue to work constructively with GFG 
and the South Australian government to explore potential options to support the Wayala Transformational Plan and ensure a sustainable and globally competitive steel industry in Wayala. I am instructed, though, uh, that until a formal proposal is actually put to the government, um, it would not be appropriate to speculate on what support could uh, or would be forthcoming. Uh, I'm also advised that uh, the government would judge any proposal on its merits, uh, taking into account a range of factors. And of course, uh, just like yourself, Senator Patrick, the government is extremely cognisant of the value of Australia's steel industry and of the steelworks in Wyala to our nation and to the local community. Um, I also agree with you that GFG's Wyala Steelworks uh, and the unique steel it produces are indeed vital assets uh, to our nation. Like structural steel itself, the steel industry is the foundation upon which many industries are built. Uh, it directly contributes almost $11 billion to Australia's GDP and employs around 100,000 people. Uh, and certainly the Morrison government is backing and advocating for the steel industry as evidenced Order, by— Senator Cash. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you uh, very much, Minister. Uh, in July, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Finance Minister announced that 6,000 tonnes of rail manufactured in Wyala had been delivered for the inland rail project. Uh, GFG has a $20 million contract to provide 14,000 tonnes of uh, rail. What, uh, just what percentage of the 262,000 tonnes of steel needed for the inland rail project will be sourced from Wyala? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. And I advise as follows. Uh, the Wyala Steelworks is a key supplier of steel for many Australian rail projects, including our $10 billion inland rail project. Uh, the inland rail is a great national infrastructure project that reflects our ongoing commitment to nation building and to improving our transport and freight networks. Uh, I can provide some clarity on the contracts awarded so far. In July 2019, the Australian Rail Transport Corporation awarded a $31 million contract uh, to GFG, which of course owns the Wyala Steelworks, uh, to supply steel rail for the next stage of inland rail construction, uh, considerably more than the Liberty Steel contract uh, that the senator referred to. Uh, I also um, point out that this builds on the $20 million contract awarded to GFG in December 2017 to supply the parks to Narrambeen uh, section of inland rail. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you. What action has the Australian government taken to ensure that Australian steel from Wyala will be used in the new high voltage transmission projects around Australia, including the Electronet high voltage interconnector planned to connect the South, Australian, uh, South Australia and New South Wales electricity grids? Would you not agree that using imported steel would be contrary to the national interest? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And, and again, I think, Senator Patrick, um, I acknowledge that you are a strong advocate for uh, your state and certainly understand your desire to see the in interconnector built uh, and running. Uh, South Australia does need uh, access to a more reliable power grid. Uh, I can advise that in September this year, the Morrison government provided Ferretti International a $600,000 grant to support a feasibility study to develop transmission tower manufacturing in Wyala using steel from the Wyala Steelworks. Uh, the outcome of the feasibility study is due to be completed by the end of the year. Ferretti may then seek to participate in the tender process to supply transmission towers to the New South Wales SA interconnector, uh, the Energy Connect project. Uh, we would certainly welcome that outcome, and we've been pleased to provide the basis on which the study and a possible tender could be uh, forthcoming. It is ultimately, of course, a decision for the Energy Connect project proponents. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on the rollout of the NDIS and how the government is getting on with the job of delivering for people with disability? The minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Mm. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And can I thank um, Senator Henderson for her question, and particularly acknowledge um, her significant involvement uh, in the NDIS and working with people with disability in her time as the Assistant Minister with that responsibility. Um, today, the government uh, has released the, the National Disability Insurance Scheme quarterly report uh, for the first quarter of 2019-2020. And as at of the 30th of September 2019, we now see more than 310,000 Australians who live with disability, including children, uh, being supported by the NDIS. Uh, that is, uh, is a significant increase and a significant improvement. Um, and one of the most significant statistics is that, for the first time, more than 110,000 people, 110,000 Australians living with disability, are receiving support for the first time. Uh, this equates to 37 per cent of the uh, NDIS participants are actually receiving assistance for the very first time, an outstanding result for those people. With respect to access decisions currently with the NDIA, in the last quarter all decisions have been progressing at an average of 12 days. That's compared with 38 days just three months prior. This means that access decisions are being made well within the legislated requirement uh, and time frame of 21 days. This means that there are currently no backlogs or delays in getting access to the NDIS. Uh, similarly, we have also seen improvements in the approval of first plans after uh, an access decision has been made, 88 days on average, in comparison to 133 days uh, in June. Waiting times for access to early childhood early intervention supports have also improved in the last quarter, with waiting times for children zero to six. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, how is the government going to further improve the rollout of the NDIS and set it up for future success? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Henderson, for your follow-up question. When the NDIS was envisaged 10 years ago, the goal was to create a scheme that would allow people with disability to better participate in the community, to get a job if that's what they wanted to do, to have greater independence, but most particularly to fulfil their potential as they wanted to. Today uh, we have announced the NDIS plan uh, to deliver on the last 20 per cent of those, for those people. Um, and this builds on the significant achievements to date and sets a pathway forward to make sure that this world-leading scheme continues to, to deliver. Our target is, and, and our estimation is that 500,000 Australians will be uh, the recipients of support through the NDIS uh, over the next five years. The most important thing is about putting the NDIS onto a business as usual and even keel for the longer term. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, can the minister explain why it is so important to put people with disability, their families and carers first? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Henderson, and thank you, Mr President. It is very clear that providing the appropriate supports to people who live with disability has a profound impact on their lives. Since the commencement of the transition of the NDIS uh, back in July 2016, the number of NDIS participants have actually grown by 930 per cent, from 30,000 to the 310,000 people that we see today who are being supported by the NDIS who live with disability. This is a national endeavour. Uh, it is a bipartisan approach to this national endeavour. It is a once-in-a-lifetime, a, a once-in-a-generation reform. And it, as was mentioned this morning, it is probably the largest social reform in Australia since the introduction of Medicare. We have heard a number of first-hand stories of people who live with disability and how the NDIS has empowered them and made their lives better. Order. Order. Senator Murray Smith. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety's interim report identified the home care packages waitlist needed urgent action. How long will the Morrison government make older Australians wait for more home care packages to reduce the waitlist? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and uh, Senator 
M. Smith might have listened to the answer that Murray L. Smith. I'm, I'm not trying to. Be, I'm not trying to be. I'm, Senator Murray L. Smith, if that suits the chamber, um, it's a term I've heard in the chamber, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. So let me put that on the record. Order. Thanks, Senator. Sen thanks, Senator Smith, Order. for the question. As I indicated in my question, answer to uh, Senator Keeler Keneally earlier, uh, the government has clearly said that it will that it will respond in, with respect to home care packages uh, prior to Christmas. The Prime Minister said that the day after the uh, interim report for the Royal Commission was released. Uh, it's been repeated by uh, other colleagues uh, and it's been repeated by me and it was repeated by me earlier in the chamber. Uh, the government takes this process extremely seriously, Mr. President. Uh, we said when the Commission re uh, interim report was released that we would consider what it said very carefully. We would take the appropriate policy response, uh, and the Prime Minister announced the following morning that we would uh, invest additional resources into home care packages prior to Christmas. Uh, that's what we said we would do. Uh, that's what we will do. Senator, order. Order. Senator Smith, so on my left, Senator Smith is on her feet. Senator Polly, Senator Smith, a supplementary question. More than 16,000 older Australians died in one year waiting for their approved home care package. The commissioners were alarmed to find that many people died waiting. How many more older Australians will die waiting for their approved home care package? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, the question actually demonstrates why this government is taking this matter so seriously. Why this government has, since last year's budget, invested $2.2 billion in new home care packages, which is why we increased the number of home care packages last financial year by 25 per cent, which for the first time has actually reduced the waiting list. So this government not only uh, takes this matter seriously, it continues to act. We called the Royal Commission because we wanted a forensic review of this industry, this sector, more broadly, so that when we did reform Senator the sector— Senator Watt, on a point of order. On relevance, the minister hasn't answered the question, how many more older Australians will die waiting for their approved Senator, home care Senator package? Watt, Senator Watt, I'm going to, I have asked before that there must be at least the claim order. Order. Senator Watt. <laughs> Senator Watt, I have asked before a point of order on direct relevance is not simply an opportunity to restate the question. It must actually make a claim about direct relevance. And I might say in that example a particularly loaded question, and given what I said this morning, I would have asked, can you at least wait? That was at the end of a question, and when there are questions loaded with pejorative terms and assumptions, a minister is allowed a lot more discretion in answering than if it is a specific question. And a point of order on direct relevance should make a claim of what the direct relevance is rather than simply read out part of a highly loaded question. And the minister was being direct relevantly, directly relevant, given the question, in my view. Senator Wong. Thank, thank you, Mr President. Uh, the, the point of order is direct relevance. And whilst I appreciate, and the opposition does appreciate, your, your exhortation not to simply reread all of the questions, sometimes reading the relevant part is necessary for direct relevance. Uh, and Senator Watt and the opposition and many Australians are extremely frustrated at this minister's refusal to answer questions about this serious well, issue. We, we, uh, we, we had an interjection from the, uh, from the government before this was a stupid question. Well, it's not to a lot of Australians. Um, uh, uh, can I? Where there is a question that, uh, in all honesty, Senator Wong, I do allow people to raise points of order. There must be the claim of direct relevance before there's a restatement. There was not in that case. And I might also say, realistically, Given that particular question that was reread, I don't think anyone expects that a minister is not going to be allowed some discretion in answering it, given that is a highly loaded question and a minister is entirely able to challenge the presumption in the question. 
Um, and there is an opportunity for debate after question time. It's not my role to determine the merits of, of answers to questions. It is not my role to determine the merits of questions themselves. Senator Colbeck, to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. And the government, in taking this matter seriously, in calling the Royal Commission in the first place, so that we could develop a policy platform that built an, an aged care system that is fit for purpose in this country, does take this matter seriously. We want to see older Australians getting the services Order, that Senator they need Colbeck. when they need to get Senator them. Smith, a final supplementary question. Will this minister take responsibility for delivering the urgent action called for by the commissioners and promise to bring forward the government's response so that older Australians aren't forced to keep waiting for the care they so desperately need? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I've already said a number of times in the chamber today that the government a has listened to what the Royal Commission has said, particularly in the context of the three urgent items that the Commission said we should, should address, and I have said that we would take action prior to Christmas, directly answering the questions that have been asked of the government. Now, we all, I've, also said, I've also said that we will go through the po proper policy development process to develop that response. So, Mr President, we will do all of those things that we've said. We are not going to play tricky inside the bubble tricks. Order we are on my going left. To Order deal on my issue. left. Order on my left. I, 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 Senator Colbeck, I have Senator Cormann on a point of order. Um, I, I know uh, it's uh, the end of the week, but uh, understanding orders, uh, constant interjections, in fact interjections full stop, are disorderly and the Leader of the Opposition doesn't cease interjecting and uh, now she's actually haranguing uh, the Minister across the table. Um, I was calling the Chamber to order as you rose on several occasions. Thank you for your assistance. I would ask Senators to hold their breaths for the next 25 minutes of question time. Order. Senator Colbeck, you have 12 seconds remaining. Thank you, thank you Mr President. Uh, the Royal Commission report also said, in respect of home care packages, that it wanted to ensure that the policy in developing that process was done properly because just putting new home care package numbers into the system doesn't necessarily resolve the problem. So we will do it in accordance with good policy Order. principles Senator and we will Colbeck, announce it time for the answer Christmas. has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. No relation to the other Senator Smith. My question, my, question, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, my friend and West Australian colleague, Senator Reynolds. Order. Can the Minister update the Senate how the rollout of the National Broadband Network is helping small and family businesses in regional, rural and remote Western Australia? Order. Before I call the Minister, I was struggling to hear the question. I call I'll call the minister, minister representing the Minister for Communication, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank uh, my colleague and good friend, Senator D. Smith, uh, for that question. But I also congratulate him uh, for his tireless advocacy for regional and rural communities right across Australia, uh, Western Australia in particular. Thank you. Uh, the Morrison government is getting on with the job of rolling out the NBN to rural and regional Australia and nowhere more so than in our home state of Western Australia. Almost all premises in regional Australia already have access to the network, and for the few that don't, construction is well underway. Regional Australia is being served by a combination of fixed line and fixed wireless services, augmented by the SkyMaster satellite services for some of the more difficult to serve premises in rural and regional Australia. Once the network rollout is complete, Around 70 per cent of premises in regional Australia will be serviced by fixed-line broadband. This level of connectivity will bring life-changing education, expertise and customers to small and family businesses in regional, rural and remote Western Australia and also, of course, around the nation. According to the 2018 Connecting Australia report by Alpha Beta, business growth in NBN connected regions accelerated at five times the pace of regions without the NBN. This growth is expected to create up to 20,000 additional jobs in regional Australia by 2021. 
And for example, the Kalgoorlie Boulder Mining Innovation Hub in Western Australia is bringing together scientists, engineers and mining experts on collaborative projects that will add significant value to the Australian minerals industry. High-speed internet on the NBN is enabling businesses of all sizes and in all locations to innovate and make connections, thanks to this government. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, how are NBN services such as Sky Master Plus helping small and family businesses, including, family, f including farming families and farming businesses? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thanks, Senator Smith, and thanks, Mr President. Uh, NBN Co has recently launched Sky Master Plus, which will provide regional Australians with even more access to data. Essential internet services such as online banking, email and software updates will not, will not count towards a consumer's data allowance when they use the SkyMaster Plus service. Also, if the monthly data cap has been reached, wholesale download speeds will not be slowed for these essential services. Early trials of SkyMaster Plus have shown that up to one third of the data used by consumers was unmetered. A full third was unmetered. By using SkyMaster Plus, small and family businesses, from farms to the local general store, will have peace of mind that they can conduct essential businesses without interruption. A great thing for rural Order. and regional Senator Australia. Reynolds. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How is the coalition's rollout of the national broadband network superior to what had been superior to what had been planned under the Rudd-Gillard government? Order. I'll, I'll call the minister when there's silence. We're chewing up. No, Senator Reynolds, I'll, I'll, call you, I'll call you when they're silent. Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President. I am really not surprised at all that those opposite do not want this chamber to be reminded of their complete and utter and abject failure on NBN. In the six years Labor connected, in six years they connected 51,000 householders. And how many are we doing every single week? We are doing 35,000 each and every week, connecting Australian households to the NBN. Those opposite paid $6 billion for the NBN to pass just 3 per cent of Australian households. $6 billion for 3 per cent of Australian households. But under this government, under the Morrison government, the NBN is now available to more than 10.2 million premises. Under Labor, the NBN missed every rollout target it set for itself. Its plan would have costed the Australian taxpayer $30 billion Order. more. Senator Reynolds, time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Order. Thank you, um, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. In evidence given at the Royal Commission into Aged Care hearings held in Mudgee just last week, Ms Susan Hood, in speaking about her husband Alan, said, and I quote, I would have liked to have taken him back home, but I had no option but to put him into an aged care facility because I couldn't get a package. It was 18 to 24 months before you could get a package to keep him at home. Why wasn't Mrs. Ms Hood able to access a home care package for her husband in Dubbo? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thank uh, Senator for the question. Uh, as I've said a number of times in the chamber, Mr President, the reason that we invested $2.2 billion into home care packages since, the, since last year's budget was because we had to continue to grow uh, the capacity of the system, uh, and that's why we grew the number of aged care packages by 25,000, 25 per cent in uh, last financial year. Uh, and we saw for the first time a fall in the waiting list, which is what Australians were looking to see. Uh, that's why, Mr. President, we called the Royal Commission so that a forensic 
view of this industry would be undertaken so that when we design policy going forward, it would be fit for purpose and not, as the Aged Care Royal Commission has described, uh, a, a series of add-ons over a period of time. Mr President, we take this extremely seriously. We want older Australians to be able to get the care that they need when they need it. We understand that there's further investment required coming out of the back of the Royal Commission, which is why the government has announced that it will make additional investment in the system. But what we will also do, Mr. President, is make sure the system works properly. We're not going to, uh, not, we're not going to create another vet fee help. We're not going to create another pink bats exercise where the market grows so rapidly that we get chunky operators in there. And the Royal Commission actually warned us against doing that. The Royal Commission report warned against doing that. So, Mr. President, so what we will do is we will take the, the appropriate policy development process. We will consider Order. this matter Senator carefully, on and we will inject. Senator, sorry, Senator Colbeck. I have Senator O'Neill on a point of order. Senator O'Neill. Um, Mr. President, the, the minister continues to um, talk about this issue in the abstract. I asked a particular question about a particular Australian who I believe deserves a response, and Mr. Co Minister Colbeck hasn't even mentioned her name let alone given her an answer to her question. Why could she not get an aged care package Order. for her husband Order. in Dubbo? The question was quite specific. I, I think context is, is legitimate in answering this. You reminded the minister of the specific nature at the point of your question. He has 22 seconds remaining to answer. I call the minister. Thank you, Mr President. Clearly, there are capacity issues with the availability of aged care package, uh, home care packages in the system. Order. And, and when the Prime Minister called the Royal Commission, he said that we needed to be prepared for some very, very sad stories. And your constituent, Ms Hood, has told one of those stories Order. to Senator the Royal Colbeck, Commission. Order. Senator Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. How many older Australians living in rural, regional and remote areas of Australia are waiting longer than 18 months to access their approved home care package. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And clearly, as I've already said a number of times, the capacity constraints in the system for home care packages needs to be addressed. And that's why the government, on receiving the interim report from the Royal Commission, particularly the instruction from the Royal Commission that we needed to address waiting lists for home care packages indicated that we would make further investments in that space. We want people to be able to access the care that they need when they need it. That's our objective. That's the whole purpose of why we've called, uh, we're undertaking order. this Senator, process. Uh, Senator Wong on a point of order. A point of order is direct relevance, and it's all very well for the minister to give expressions of sympathy, but he is the responsible minister, and the question is how many? How many Australians in rural and regional Australia are waiting more than 18 months? Yep. Senator, on the point of order, um, this question had no preamble. The question sought a fact. Um, I don't believe in it there was any terms that ministers could legitimately say were politically loaded. Uh, and so I remind the minister of the specific nature of the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. There are too many Australians who are waiting. Uh, over. There are too many, I, Mr. Mr. President. There are too many Australians who are waiting too long for home care packages, which is why the government has said it intends to invest order. Senator, further into Order, Australia. Senator Colbeck, Senator O'Neill. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. A again, I have mentioned the context of regional, rural, and remote areas. The minister hasn't even mentioned those words in his response, let alone come up with numbers. If he can't answer the question, very specifically quest, uh, organised question, he should take it on notice and give us the actual data. Um, this question was specific, without a preamble, without loaded terminology, that sort of fact. I'm going to ask the minister to turn to the specifics of the question. He has five seconds to rem remaining to answer. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't have a specific number for rural and regional Australians with me, and I'm happy to take that number. Order. Yeah. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Do you agree with evidence given at the Royal Commission hearings in Mudgee last week that older Australians wait longer for home care packages 
especially higher level packages in remote areas, and that many of these services in those contexts may not be available at all. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think I've very clearly indicated that older Australians, whether they're in regional Australia or in metropolitan Australia, are waiting too long for home care packages. The objective of the government in its policy development work is to reduce the waiting list. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly stated yeah. objective. They're waiting too long. The Royal Commission told us that. The, the Royal Commission told us to take action, and we intend to address that. Uh, our investment into home care packages demonstrated our significant investment, $2.2 billion since last year's budget, indicates that we take this matter seriously. We are looking to reduce the number of home care packages. We injected an increase of 25 per cent last year and saw for the first time a reduction in waiting lists. We have said that we will invest further in this space. We take this matter seriously and, as I have said a number of times, we want older Australians to be order. able to get the care Senator that they can. Senator O'Neill, on a um, can I just remind the minister that I did ask if he could clarify that many of the services may not be available at Senator all in those contexts? You are, that was part of your question. Another part of your question is do you ask the minister whether he agrees? Um, that was a broad question in contrast to the previous one, so I think with respect the minister is being directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Colbeck. I'll finish my, I'll finish no. my. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I'm very pleased to ask a question of the Minister for Agriculture and fellow Victorian, Senator McKenzie. Can Order. the Minister outline how the Victorian Labor government's ban on native forestry, forestry will impact regional communities in Victoria? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Patterson. Our government knows how important the forestry industry is to Australia. It directly employs over 52,000 people many more thousands indirectly, and contributes nearly $24 billion to the national economy. Places like Hewanville, Maryborough, Tumit and Marysville, where I grew up. And rather than blue collar, the men that, and probably women that work in the forestry industry wear blue singlets like my dad did. And that's why Victoria's government's decision to cease all native forest harvesting in state forests by 2030 is disappointing because it's selling out these people, it is selling out these regional communities, and it is selling them out not so they can grow and prosper on a sustainable resource, but to buy votes against Senator Di Natale uh, and Senator Rice in inner urban seats of Melbourne. Of Melbourne. But it's not just the Australian government. It's not just the Australian government that condemns this decision by the Andrews Labor government. It's actually one of the Labor Party's largest donors. Oh, Mr Michael O'Connor, no less, actually has labelled this decision as heartless and stupid to end the native hardwood timber forestry industry in Victoria by 2030. They, like all of us, should be disgusted at how quickly Labor has forgotten the workers just like in the last federal election, they forgot the miners in central Queensland and WA. They are now turning their back on the forestry workers, and we will see upwards of 5,000 jobs lost uh, right throughout regional com communities in timber towns uh, in our state, uh, home state of Victoria, Senator Patterson. And I know you, like I, want to see more people employed in our home state in primary production rather than less. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, I do, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on why Victoria still needs a native forestry industry? Senator Mackenzie. Well, the Australian government has always supported the renewable, sustainable native forestry industry in Victoria, and our policy for forestry is to ensure both strong plantation and native forest sector. We also support vibrant regional communities and the people that live and work in them. We back the 5,000 people that work in the forestry industry in Victoria. We back their families and we back their communities. Our government knows that beautiful Australian-grown natural hardwood is a sustainable resource and therefore in demand for very, very good reasons. We're actually proud of this, very proud. The demand is high the appearance for appearance-grade forest products that can only be sourced in large quantities from native forests. Let's be clear. 
uh, let's be clear, for every single tree that is harvested in Victoria, it is replanted and regrown in native forestry. Only a very small area of Victoria is actually subject to this, 0.04 per cent of the total publicly Order, owned Senator area. Senator McKenzie, time for the answers expired. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Rather than shutting it down, how is the Liberal and Nationals government supporting the Australian forestry industry, and is the minister aware of any alternative views? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you. <laughs> We're committed to growing the forestry industry, and we took a strong plan to the election, and we're delivering on it thanks to a fabulous assistant minister in Senator Dunningham. Our national forestry industries plan is underway and has the goal of a billion new plantation trees over the next decade to meet that growing demand for wood. We've already established five new pilot regional forestry hubs to support strategic uh, planning for future needs of the industries. We've got a draft consultation paper out for half a billion dollar of concessional loan program of how we can actually encourage expansion in plantation. The industry knows we're on their side because we are the side of politics that's actually delivering for them. So do their workforce and so do their regional communities. And when you ask me about alternatives, there's only one out there, and it's the Greens' plan to actually shut down an entire industry and a desperate Labor Party that refuses to stand Order, up. Order, Senator McKenzie. Very quick, there, Senator Farrell. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question, unsurprisingly, is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. This week, in response to my questions in the Senate regarding the community sports. Infrastructure Grants Program, the Minister stated, and I quote, every project that was funded under this program was eligible for funding. However, Sports Australia has made it very clear in written evidence that some of these grants were not recommended to Senator McKenzie. Oh. Does the Minister not understand the difference or does he just not care? The Minister for Youth and Sports, Senator Colbert. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm not sure who's got the comprehension problem here. Uh, the question, Order. The, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I have Order. to say, uh, I, the, the, I answered the question, Mr. President. I answered the question that, that I was asked by Senator Farrell. Uh, every, every grant, every grant that was approved by Senator Ken McKenzie uh, under that program uh, qualified under the guidelines of the program. That's what I said. Every single, every single uh, grant that was approved by Senator McKenzie under the program uh, was uh, qualified under the guidelines of the program. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, I do have uh, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that, after being initially assessed by Sport Australia, no application under this program was sent back for reassessment at the request of Senator McKenzie or her ministerial office. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. No, I can't confirm that. Uh, I'll have to take that on notice, Senator Farrell. Uh, but, as the, but, as the, but as the delegate, uh, the final responsibility, the final responsibility for approval of each grant uh, was Minister McKenzie's, because she was the delegate under the guidelines of the program. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Yes, I do have one. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Has the current minister followed in the footsteps of his predecessor, Senator McKenzie, and personally handpicked grant recipients against the recommendation of his agency? <laughs> Senator Colbeck. Oh, yeah, that's right as well. <laughs> Senator, uh, when I get recommendations from uh, my department or my agency. Uh, I will do what every minister does. I will do what every minister does. I will consider those recommendations and then I will make an appropriate decision uh, based on the advice that I receive. Uh, that's what ministers do. That's the privilege that a minister has uh, being sworn in as a minister of the Crown. So when I receive advice from my agency, I will consider that advice, uh, I'll note that advice. But as a minister, uh, I have the responsibility to make decisions. Senator Coleman. I ask that further questions be placed in a notice paper. Catch you later. Yeah. See you afterwards.
Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Polly. Uh, just a moment, Senator Polly. May I ask that senators leave the chamber quietly, please? Um, please continue, Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. We on this side of the chamber have been asking Senator this— Senator Polly, what are you taking note of? I am sorry. I'm taking note of answers given by Senator Colbeck to questions asked by Labor Senators Keneally, Smith and O'Neill. And I'm Thank doing so because on this side of the chamber we have urgently been asking the government to respond now to the Royal Just Commission Just a moment. Into sorry, H Senator Care. Keneally. I'm going to call for order again. I'm asking if you're not participating in this session, please leave the chamber and please leave quietly. Senator Keneally. Uh, Senator uh, Polly. Can I start my time again, please, after all these interruptions? Yes. Thank you. We'll reset, reset the, clock. the clock. This is really important to the Australian community, and that is what has been exposed through the Royal Commission into Aged Care, the harm, the neglect and the lack of funding. But this isn't something that's just happened. This government was warned over eight months ago by its own department about how to fix the crisis with the aged care package's home care package wait list. Now, we know between 18 months to 24 months, older Australians are having to wait for a care package that they have been assessed as needing. There's Record after record of people making contact with my office and with every member of every office on the Labor side, whether on this side of the House or whether it's in that other place. People are waiting. 92-year-olds are wait, having to wait and being told they have to wait 18 months for a home care package. We have now the figures that demonstrate very clearly that there's been over 16,000 older Australians who have been assessed for the home care package have died. Have died. There's 14,000 older Australians who want to stay at home and had been assessed to need a home care package that, because that package was not provided to them in a timely manner, was forced to go into a residential care home. Forced. Now, for this government to say, well, we've got the Royal Commission's interim report, so we have to wait and something will happen at some time. There's been 14 reports over the last six years demonstrating very clearly the need for more investment and better transparency into the aged care se sector. The Prime Minister himself, when he was Treasurer, gutted the aged care sector. He gutted a billion dollars they took out of the aged care sector. They used the aged care sector as a, an ATM. So they can talk about having empathy now for older Australians and those that have been neglected and abused in the aged care sector. But what we need to see now is real action. Waiting for Christmas. Which Christmas? This is not new. I have been involved in countless inquiries since I've been in the Senate. We know that there's been report after report gathering dust. We've had four ministers now in the six years that those on that side have been in government, and each one of those ministers have failed the Australian people, failed some of the most people who are the most deserving of our respect and our care. These are the people that help build this country. They are our parents. They are our grandparents. They deserve to be treated in their later years with respect and dignity. And quite frankly, I don't think that's too much to ask. I am ashamed to be an Australian senator when we have to sit by and hear day after day the stories, the real stories of the family's struggles with not being able to get the support to keep their older loved ones at home. We know that there's a shortfall of aged care workers. We know those workers need better pay. But what we've seen from this government, minister after minister, is their lack of empathy, their lack of concern, and most galling is their lack of interest in the aged care sector. That's galling. Because we as a nation are judged by the, the way we treat our young people, how we treat our most vulnerable people and how we treat older Australians. 
And if I sat on that side of the chamber on the government bench, I would be hanging my head in shame. We now have the Minister for Aged Care, a Tasmanian minister, who has this responsibility. We are the fasting ageing population in this country. He knows only too well of the countless incidents that have been reported to the Aged Care Commission in Tasmania this very week. He lives in the area where some of those atrocities are happening. We don't have a minister in Cabinet who has some authority to sit round the Cabinet table, unlike the previous Labor governments, where we elevated this ministerial responsibility to a Cabinet minister. So they were there at the Cabinet table speaking up for these people. It is an indictment on this government, an indictment that they still have not taken the action that now not only those 16 to Thank reports you, that have been indicated, Polly, but the Royal expired. Commission. Senator Senator McMahon. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. I rise to take note of answers Minister Cormann provided to Senator Di Natale regarding um, fires, Senator firefighting. Senator McMahon, um, the opposition determines who we're taking note of, and that is that we're taking note of questions um, to Senator Colbeck from Senator Keneally, Smith and O'Neill. Senator Polly, so it's on the matter of aged care. Okay, thank you. Um, aged care is a, is a topic that's extremely important to this government. We know that we have a lot of older Australians that rely on us. We have an ageing population. We're very well aware of that. We have commitments to delivering for aged care and for the elderly. We're delivering record investment. Over the forward estimates, from $13.3 billion in 2012-13 under Labor, growing to $21.7 billion in 19-20. Um, this will grow to an estimated $25.4 billion in 22-23. Um, these, are, these are quite high figures. This does not show yes, that we are negating our responsibility to the aged care sector. This, in fact, shows um, a great deal of concern by this government to make sure that we're meeting our obligations to older Australians. It's on average $1.2 billion of extra support for older Australians each year over the forward estimates. 1.2 billion. It's not unsubstantial. Making improvements to aged care for all senior Australians continues to be one of this government's key priorities. That's why the Prime Minister called a royal commission into aged care quality and safety, because we care and we place a high degree of value on this system. We're committed to providing senior Australians with support to live in their own homes for longer. New home care packages have increased from 60,308 under Labor in 2012-13, 125,119 in 2018, projected to 157,154 in 2023. That's a massive increase that this government has undertaken to provide. Again, that's, that's not something that's um, unsubstantial. Labor, on the other hand, at the election, provided no additional funding in their costings for home care places. Yet they are happy to sit there and criticise us on our performance and the places that we are providing. Labor committed nothing to additional funding for quality of aged care, workforce or residential aged care. Absolutely nothing additional. Yet we have a very strong commitment in this area. Recent achievements that we, uh, that we have 
undertaken, residential funding reform. This government is trialling a new aged care funding instrument, which will emphasise placing the safety and well-being of residents above financial and business priorities. Again, that doesn't sound like we don't care or we're not committed. Home care packages. You attack us on that, yet this government has invested $2.2 billion to address the waitlist for home care packages. Again, it's not like we're not listening or not acting. New aged care quality standards and charter of aged care rights. Standards which commenced on 1 July 2019 apply to all aged care services, including residential home care, flexible care and services provided in um, aged care facilities. The standards focus on quality outcomes for the consumer rather than provider processes. The Charter of Rights provides the same rights to all consumers regardless of the type of aged care funding or service they receive. Again, an initiative and a priority of this government. We offer a streamlined assessment. The government's committed $14.8 million over two Thank years. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. And, um, you can hear in Senator McMahon's voice that she is a sincere person, but it must be very difficult for her to come into this third term of the Liberal National Party government. As a coalition member, particularly representing regional and rural Australia, and know in her community how this government has failed. How this government has failed dismally. This is not a new government. Mr Morrison tries to look like it's all brand new. Oh, we, we, we've found this terrible problem in aged care and we're going to have an inquiry. Well, we definitely needed the inquiry, but we need the inquiry now because the government failed to do its job for the last six years. And in fact, Mr Morrison, before he was the Prime Minister, had a really good go at taking out critical funding for this sector. Senator McMahon said in her comments that they're investing some money. She said 1.4 billion isn't an insignificant amount. It's not an unsubstantial amount, is what she said. I agree, it's not an unsubstantial amount. But let's go back to the first budget of Mr Morrison as a treasurer to see what he really thinks about aged care. Because he took $1.2 billion out. When you take that much money out of the aged care sector, Something's going to give. And I tell you what gave? The aged care sector gave. And older people around this country are paying. People who love them are paying with their grief. People who expected this government to look after them have been failed by them. People like the woman who gave evidence just last week in Dubbo, in Mudgee, sorry, Miss Susan Hood. This is all she wanted. I would have liked to have taken him back home, she said. But I had no option but to put him in an aged care facility because I couldn't get a package. It was 18 to 24 months before you could go and get a package to keep him at home. 18 to 24 months. That is the consequence. That story of Miss Hood and her very real husband in the very real place in Mudgee on our time is a consequence of the decision making of this hard hearted, miserly Liberal National Party government who ripped $1.2 billion out as the first order of business when they came to this place. And you saw the pitiful, pitiful response of the Minister for Ageing today. Oh, I, my, my heart breaks for these people. Well, they need a lot more than his breaking heart. They need money in a system. They need an aged care workforce. These guys have abrogated their responsibility to the aged in this country year after year after year after year after year after year. That's it. That's six years they've been doing this. This is no surprise. It is a great shame, but it is no surprise. And in regional and rural Australia, it is even worse. Even worse. This government has been so bad 
at looking at the workforce in healthcare and in aged care across this country. They removed funding from the agencies that actually planned for workforce. They just took the money away. It's funny how if you don't plan, things don't actually happen. And we are finding, we are finding now in regional and rural Australia, which is represented by members of the National Party who are in here defending their government's current position, that people that they know in a road down in a street just down the road from them, in a house just down the road from them, or in a farm maybe 50 kilometres from where they live, they know the stories that I said about Ms Hood are correct. They know people in their community who are knocking on their doors right across this country saying, just give me an aged care home package. We know that there's 120,000 of them. In fact, Senator McMahon was honest enough to put on the record, I think it was 125,000 that she said were going to be, 125,000 in 2019, 157,154 by 22-23. And what, what do we get out of the minister today? Well, we might give you a little Christmas present of a bit more money and we'll tell you sometime just before Christmas. It's not enough. It's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. If they're going to give the money they needed to give it years ago, Thank you, not Senator hold it out for Christmas, it's a disgrace. Expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. You might be surprised to hear how excited I am to make a contribution immediately following Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill made a very, very revealing comment. She said, if you don't plan, then nothing happens. If you don't plan, then nothing happens. Now, when I was thinking about my contribution uh, a few moments ago, I thought, I'm not going into the politics. This is too important a national issue. I'm not going to go into the politics, and I actually don't think that Australians are interested in the politics of aged care. I do think they are interested in the solutions. But, but Senator Keneally, hear me out. You'll be very you won't be surprised, actually. You won't be surprised, because I'm someone that guesses that you watch the media very, very regularly. Watch your tweets, watch Twitter. I'll come to ABC's comments about the false claims that Richard Miles made just a few days ago. Um, Senator ABC Smith, fact check. Senator Smith, please refer to those in the other place by their correct title and address the chair. Thank you very not much. Individual I thought you were going to call me uh, to order about using a prop. I didn't see that, <laughs> but you've self-confessed. Uh, thank you. So I was thinking to myself. Do we want to talk about the politics or do we want to talk about the substance of the issue? Because this is a very, very significant and important issue. What the Royal Commission interim report makes very, very clear is that not just this government, but all governments over a long period of time could have done better in planning for and building a better aged care system. Now, Senator Keneally is not going to jump to her feet, her feet and dispute that claim because that's, an, that's a correct claim, and that's what the Royal Commission report actually says. But what we've seen in the brief contributions thus far this afternoon is Labor Party senators not being able to resist, resist the opportunity to go right to the politics, right to the politics on this issue, rather than the substance, rather than the substance. No one disputes that calling the Royal Commission was necessary. No one disputes that. Um, no one disputes much of what has been reported in the interim report because it's been done by credible Royal Commissioners. There will be debates, absolutely there will be debates, about what is the correct future course for aged care in our country. But nothing, nothing displays, nothing holds out the rawness of the politics of Labor on this aged care issue than this one fact. On the 18th of May, Australians had an opportunity to cast their judgment about what, a fu what future government they wanted. And yes, they chose the coalition for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons they didn't vote for Labor, and one of the reasons older Australians didn't vote for Labor, because guess how much Labor talked about aged care in the weeks and the months leading up to the 18th of May? Guess how much, 
How much did Bill Shorten, how much of his time did he spend Senator talking about Smith, aged care? Not very please much. Please refer to those in Not the other Not very much. Senator what, Smith, oh, I'm sorry. calling you to order. Thank you, Madam. Please refer to those in the other place by their correct titles. So, the former Leader of the Opposition, during the election campaign, how much time did he spend talking about aged care? How much? Zilch. More telling is this point. More telling is this point. In Labor's own budget documents, in its own financial plan for this country, guess how much money, guess how much money the former leader of the opposition, supported by all these Labor opposition senators, guess how much money they committed to aged care in our country? How much? A million? Nope. Not one red cent. Not one red cent. So now they march into the chamber, very brazen, talking about the Aged Care Royal Commission, but in the weeks and months leading up to the 18th of May, they did not talk about it, and more damning, they did not commit one red cent. Now, the challenge for Senator Keneally, the challenge for Senator Smith is this, to stand up in your five-minute contributions and say that you were going to put more money into aged care. Because if you do, if you do, you can't say it. You can't say it because you were not going to do it. You are not going to do it. So their politics on this Aged Care Royal Commission is brazen, is brazen. And it's only a matter of time before they get found out. I draw your attention, Senator Keneally, and I hope you refer to it in your contribution to the ABC. Um, Senator Smith, please resume your seat. Well, Senator Keneally. Senator Smith, not to reflect upon who is in the chamber and who isn't during his remarks. Secondly, it may disappoint him to know I'm not here to make a contribution oh. in this debate. And my third point of order is he's using a prop. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, Senator Smith, in response to the point of order, on that occasion, he was reading from paper, um, so I don't accept that point of order. But yes, um, Senator Smith, you know we don't reflect on people whether they're Apologies, in the chamber Madam or Deputy not. President. Please continue. So I encourage everyone who is interested in this issue to go to the ABC fact check of Tuesday, the 12th of November this week, and it's headed a year after we ABC fact check. Claimed, mis uh, uh, reported on misleading claims. These are Labor's misleading claims about aged care funding. Richard Miles, I'm quoting from the uh, ABC headline. Richard Thank Miles. Thank you, Senator it. Smith. Your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I also rise to take note on questions to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, uh, Senator Colbeck, by myself and Senators Keneally and O'Neill. And I just want to start by responding to my fellow Senator Smith. I didn't walk in here brazenly today at all. I walked in here concerned. Actually, I walked in here horrified by the findings of that report. And I asked my questions. No, not embarrassed. Order. And through you, Order. Chair. I didn't walk in here brazenly. I walked in here concerned. Concerned on the behalf of millions of Australians who are also deeply, deeply concerned by the findings of the interim report. And I acknowledge that the minister, he showed some concern. He showed some concern for the findings of the report. I acknowledge that. But we need more than concern. We need more than empathy. He's the minister responsible, the minister responsible. We need action. He holds the, key, holds the keys to be able to take that action. He holds the keys to a response. And that's what we're asking for. So please continue to show your concern, as we will, but that's not what we're seeking here. We're seeking a response. We're seeking action on an aged care system that this report shows us is fundamentally broken. There is not one part of Australia's aged care system that isn't impacted by crisis. And while Labor is prepared, of course, to work constructively with the Morrison Liberal government to progress long-term reform challenges, there are three things the Royal Commission says it must urgently address now to fix Australia's broken aged care system. One, ensure older Australians are getting the care at home when they need it most. Two, end the over-reliance of chemical restraints in aged care. And three, stop the unacceptable number of young people entering residential aged care. Now, you can come here and say we're making political points. You can come and talk about the election and you can talk about the past. But the fact is we're not in government. You are. And your minister is responsible. Your minister is responsible. He can fix this. He can fix this. 
and we'll work with him, we'll work with you, and we'll share our concern, but he can fix it. That's what we're asking. We're asking for answers. We're asking for action. We're asking for a timeline. We're asking for better on behalf of millions and millions and millions of Australians who share our concern, all of our concern. That's what we're asking for. We cannot and must not wait until the final report in November 2020. There are 120,000 older Australians waiting for aged care at home, with wait times now more than two years for the highest levels of care. 16,000 people have died in one year waiting for their approved package. There are another 14,000 Australians who have had to enter residential aged care because they could no longer stay at home waiting for care that wasn't there. On each of these items, it's too many, it's too many people. And we know others have been forced to enter the hospital system and emergency departments. On top of the home care packages, waitlist crisis, a week doesn't go by without another disturbing account emerging about the mistreatment or neglect of our older Australians in residential care. And we know there also aren't enough aged care workers and the ones who are there aren't paid enough. Australia is far from having the workforce that is required to care for our ageing population. But like so many other policy failures in this place, none of this had to happen. It wasn't inevitable. It's a product of inaction and cuts by this government. And the failures start at the top and the responsibility for action is at the top and it is with the minister and it is with this government. There is a blueprint in front of you, a blueprint in front of you, which shows you a path through this, which shows you what you can do now, it shows you what you must urgently do now to fix and address this crisis. It's there in front of you, clear as day. Act on it. You can act on it. The minister can act on it. The prime minister can act on it. The government can act on it. Don't focus on us. Focus on the policy levers in front of you that you can use to fix this crisis. The Prime Minister and his government must do better to ensure older Australians get the quality aged care services that they deserve now. Older Australians and their loved ones cannot afford to wait any longer. The Prime Minister called for the establishment of the Royal Commission. We welcomed it. It was the right thing to do and a good thing to do. But now the interim report is here. It has recommendations. You know what to do. Do it. Take action now Thank for the you, older Senator Australians Smith, depending on your you. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Polly to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. I rise to take note of answers in response to Senator Di Natale's questions. The, from you? From, from, from. Yeah, thank you. Uh, from, sorry, Deputy President, from, from me. Do you yes. mean? Oh, I don't yes. quite understand that. Are you taking note of questions? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm, taking, I'm rising to take note of answers in response to Senator Di Natale's questions. To, sorry, to which minister? Uh, it was to Minister Cormann. Thank you. Yeah. The most important role for a government, any government, is to protect its citizens. And Senator Di Natale's question raised a very, very important topic an issue in the Senate today at Senate question time. What is the role of the federal government in protecting its citizens in this country from the bushfire, the climate emergency that we've seen unfolding in recent weeks? Indeed, we've been asking these questions for years because we have seen these fires, changes in our weather patterns, fires outside of fire season, Fires burning in areas where we've never seen them burn before. We've been asking these questions now for years. What is the role of the federal government in protecting its citizens? If we are entering a future, and that's what all the best available science tells us, entering a future of climate breakdown, where we're going to see more and more extremes, more droughts, more cyclones, more floods, more ocean warming events, then the federal government must play a critical role in defending the life and property of its citizens. I'd ask senators to consider this. What do you think is the biggest threat to national security to every Australian citizen in this country? 
What is the biggest threat? If we're talking about threat to life and we're talking about threat to property, I ask you what is a bigger threat than the kind of wildfires we've seen in recent weeks? Now, Senator De Natale asked the government today whether they're going to respond to the experts in this area. The 23 delegation of fire chiefs who have been wanting to meet with the Prime Minister to ask for more resources and ask for more coordination from the federal government in how we respond to disasters and how we build resilience to disasters in this country. And once again, just like the Prime Minister fobbing off the fire chiefs, the government completely dismissed his questions today. Well, the Greens initiated a Senate inquiry over two years ago into the role of defence force and climate change in the future of climate change. I was very proud to be part of that committee. We heard from hundreds of experts about the threat posed to our national security from the breakdown that we're going to see and expected to see in climate. And it's interesting we talked about the role of the defence forces and the role that they can play in helping protect Australian citizens from wildfires and other extreme weather events. And just this week in the Senate, in this chamber at Senate question time, we heard our defence minister say that we are seeing an unprecedented rollout of Australian defence forces this week to help communities affected by these horrendous bushfires. I honestly didn't think I would hear that in this chamber in my time in the Senate, but it's already happened. Where is the planning for the disaster resil resilience we're going to see in a future of climate emergency? In today's climate emergency, the Greens in 2016 and 2018 took to the elections a policy informed by the Senate inquiry, may I say, to spend $500 million on a national response disaster unit that coordinated between states and bought the assets necessary, such as the fire bombers that Senator Dinatan only asked about today, such as the helicopters, the remote area firefighting capability, the coordination between the states. Where is the leadership on not just acting on climate change, but on how we're actually going to adapt to this future that we've got to face. And may I say while we're at it, if it's a matter of funds and it's a matter of money, just remember, and I'll just give one example to senators, through the petroleum resource rent tax loops, we've allowed fossil fuel companies who are creating the problems that we've got today, we've allowed them to take away $380 billion in tax credits. That would Climate proof our country ten times over if we were to recoup those kind of revenues and spend them where they're needed to protect Australia's citizens. It is a government's number one role to protect its citizens. This government has failed and it's been caught out, and now is the time to plan Thank you, Senator for a future Wilson. of climate Your emergency. Our time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wilson to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to tabling and consideration of committee.